This is the day the Lord made. Let us rejoice and be glad. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We welcome you in this virtual space to praise our risen Lord on this fourth Sunday in Advent. We are grateful for all that God has brought us through and we come to praise the Lord again this Sunday with joy in our hearts and surrounded by an unconditional love of our Father. As we enter into this worship space, join us as we go into our opening hymn, Joy to the World. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world who sang. Till he appears and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, a weary world we rejoice for yonder. A new and glorious morn fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angels' voice.
God be the glory. Oh, holy night, what a night divine, what a day of celebration, what an opportunity of praise. Please join us now as we pray. Eternal God, our Father and our Creator, we thank you so much for speaking to the shepherds on that holy night, but for delivering to us a Savior, a Savior who is born King of all kings. We thank you, God, for the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father. And God, on this day of worship and praise, we invoke and we thank you for sending your presence to be with us. God, from the words that have already been spoken, the prayers that have already been given, God, for the songs that have been lifted up in your honor, we are indeed grateful. And we pray now, God, that at this preaching moment, you would indeed speak your word to your people. Humble me, God, that as I stand behind this sacred desk, that your will is done. Thank you, God, for those on the other side of the screen who will hear and will see, but most importantly, those who will receive. For God, we recognize that without you, we can't do anything. But with you, God, all things are possible. So on this day, this holy day, the day of which you have proclaimed to be your day, we pray that you will have your will. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, we offer this prayer that all who are able say amen. To God be the glory, great things God has done. We greet you on this Sabbath day, this fourth Sunday of Advent. We are grateful for the voices that have been lifted up to honor God, to Deacon Pashan, and thank you for the ministry of music that you give, and we thank also for our band. We praise God for our AV team. For those who are here in the house, we are so grateful for uh, our centurions. We thank God for the COVID-19 team. Again, major shout out to Pastor Lanson and the great work that she is doing in leading our youth, our young adults, to Dr. Carol, who is on our Facebook Live right now as the, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the virtual pastor. She and Pastor Lanson, they are there in the chat room. So if you have uh, comments, praises, uh, questions about anything of the church, Church. Please don't hesitate to connect with them right now. Uh, to our floor manager here, uh, Deacon Donna, praise God for you, Minister Donna, excuse me, and also to those who are working the sound, we are indeed grateful. Today, I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you have it on your phone or in old school turning pages, to the Gospel of Matthew. We want to look at Matthew chapter 2, reading verses 1 through 12 from the Holy Writ. And as I read this word, I invite you to read along with me the word of Almighty God. For the Bible says, Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About, the time, about that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called the meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, uh, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the first star appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship with him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave them gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
And if you could, I'd like to lift up verse 12 as our sermonic text for this morning, for it will serve as the backdrop of all that we want to preach and teach on. For that verse simply says, and when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. With the aid of the Holy Spirit and your encouragement, I want to lift up this text today, y'all, and for a brief moment, preach on our subject, the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas. My friends, from billboards to robocalls, from direct mailers to unsolicited letters, from advertisements to promos, from the internet to the nightly news, Many of us, if not all of us, have a story or two to talk about being overwhelmed with messages. If I'm talking to you this morning, you may as well just shout amen. From, from, from hear what I'm saying, from, from what we hear on the radio to what we watch on TV, from what is played as background music to what pops up on the screen of our computer, many of us, if not all of us, have a story or two to tell about being overloaded with messages. And y'all, when I say messages, I'm talking about those communication exchanges that attempt to persuade us to believe a certain idea. Messages, those expressions that attempt to sway us to behave a certain way. Messages, those invitations that move our thoughts and emotions and messages, those solicitations, regardless if they show up at 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night. They make us go where we should not go and stay longer than we need to stay. Somebody say amen. My friends, my friends, please hear what I'm saying as, as from the onset of this sermon because I, I, I want you to recognize that I am of the belief and I think I have some amens this morning listening to what I'm saying who will say without a shadow of a doubt that you have had your share of unwanted messages. And you wouldn't lose an ounce of sleep, if the truth be told, if you were deleted from some direct mailing list because why you have a story or two to tell about being overloaded with messages. And to be very honest with you, the primary reason that you receive messages, y'all, is one of three purposes. That is, you get messages to educate, messages to entertain, or messages to persuade. And thanks to the likes of McDonald's and Nike and Apple, sometimes you get these messages and they don't even have to present or say their names. You just see an Apple symbol and you know you're talking about a phone or a computer. You see a Nike swish and you are reminded of the exercise that you are not doing. And you look at a M, a big M in yellow, gold, or whatever you want to call it, and a child who doesn't even know how to read no, I'm going to get a Happy Meal with a toy. These messages, y'all, are given to us because they are either given to entertain, to educate, or persuade. Messaging, y'all, they are powerful and messaging. They are persuasive and messages have an impact. And of course, as we enter this last week of Advent, this final uh, gathering, as we talk and light the Advent wreath, we focus on the message of love and preparation to receive a renewal of Christ into our lives. And I want to make sure that you understand this week that the message that the Bible is still giving is a message of hope and a message of peace and a message of joy and a message of love. And, and I don't want you to get it twisted because today's message is not to remind you that you have five more days of shopping before Christmas, but today's message is a message about Christmas. And with that in mind, I want to talk to you for a brief moment, y'all, on the message of 
Christmas. Can you just type right there? We're going to get a message. We will get a message about Christmas and a message about the Christ. For to start with, my friends, I want you to know that Christmas is all about the message of God and the coming of our Savior. The message of Christmas, my friends, is found in God bringing the Savior into the world. It is a message of promise and a message of hope. It is a message of faith. For what is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I want to focus y'all today on the message of love. For delivered from the heavenly angels spoken to shepherds while watching their flock in a field, the angel says, I bring you good news and great joy. That's a message, y'all, a message of good news and great joy that will, be, that will fulfill the promises of Almighty God. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. Church, the message of the angels and the message of the gospel is a message of God's declaration of God's deliverance. The promises of God have been fulfilled and through the birth of the Savior, the message of God is a proclamation, my friends, of joy. And that ought to be somebody's word right there because I'm saying to you as a pastor and I'm saying to you as a friend that the message of Christmas is about joy. The plan of God was being achieved, my friends, to the one who was on his way from heaven down to earth. The message, y'all, gives us a direct and a specific picture of our Savior and his role and his power. And you see, the person to whom the message is really given about the Savior is told to Mary. For the Bible tells us is that you will be with child and give birth to a son and give him the name of Jesus. You see, Mary, y'all, was, was a virgin and Mary was engaged to Joseph and Mary, y'all, was selected to carry uh, the, earth, the heavenly child into earth. She will give birth to a son and, and the name Jesus would be what she and Joseph would call this baby boy. The name Jesus, my friend, was given to both Mary and Joseph and they were to give this name to their son. The name Jesus, y'all, was chosen by God and placed upon the baby Jesus. But it wasn't just Mary and Joseph who got the naming rights for when you see the book of Isaiah, Isaiah would say the virgin will indeed conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God is with us. Emmanuel, God is present. Emmanuel, God is all around us. The name of Jesus, y'all, communicates the idea of deliverance that has come down from heaven to the people on earth. The name of Jesus, my friends, infers, infers that liberation comes through that name. The name of Jesus, y'all, means that freedom comes through that name. The name of Jesus, y'all, means that emancipation comes through that name. The name of Jesus, y'all, means that salvation comes through that, oh, I'm preaching harder than you responded. I need you to know that the name of Jesus means that you will have freedom in everywhere and everything that you do. You will have a salvation in all that you encompass. And I want you to understand because I can imagine there's only about a few of y'all who understand what I'm talking about this morning because you see I've used words like deliverance and used words uh, like, uh, like liberation and used words like emancipation and used words like salvation and you see those are foreign words to some folk because you see if you have never messed up and if you have never slipped up, you see, you don't understand what being free in the name of Jesus is all about. So you see, I want somebody to help me preach this Sunday morning who has messed up and slipped up and fallen down. And you know, if it had not been for you calling on the name of Jesus, if it had not been for you saying, Father, I stretch my, if it, come on, help me preach. 
preach right there. If it had not been for you calling on Jesus, you could have been six feet under. But thanks be to God, God has given you another day. Thanks be to God, God has given you another shout. Thanks be to God, God has given you one more opportunity in the name of Jesus. You see, I, I need somebody to help me today recognize that there is freedom in Jesus because, you see, sometimes the devil will throw tricks in front of me and probably in front of you to hold us captive. But when we call on the name of Jesus, my friends, that just frees us up to be all God calls us to be. You see, the message of Christmas, my friends, is a message that will get you into some good trouble. Say amen if you can. Now, if you've been in bad trouble, you just say ouch right there. But, but it will get you into some good trouble. It will also direct you to obey. And the message number three will lead you to worship. Number one, it's going to get you into some good trouble. Number two, it's going to direct you to obey. And number three, it will lead you to worship. You see, the message of Christmas on the first point I want to make will get you into some good trouble. Can you type good trouble right there in the chat box? Because when you look at the text, it starts at verse 1. It says, about that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have come to worship him. King Herod, the Bible says, was deeply disturbed. And when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem, the Bible says is that people were disturbed when they heard that Jesus was around. And Herod Job was, well, was, was an evil, was a ruling king uh, that was placed there not by choice, but placed there, shall we say, by force. He was in an unoccupied land. He was an Edomite. He had some Jewish ancestry about him, but he was not the chosen one. And friends, recognize when you are not chosen, you will get trouble. When you are not chosen, you will get agitated. When you are not chosen, you will be troubled. The Greek word for trouble, Minister Donna, is tarasso, and it means that Herod and all of Jerusalem were disturbed and upset. Hear what I'm saying, Deacon Bachar. It means is that, is that when you are not chosen by God, then you are operating and functioning under the auspices of the devil. When you are not chosen by God, then your actions and your reactions are not holy. When you are not chosen by God, that means your response is not of the Lord. The people were agitated, y'all. They were in a state of severe, severe emotion distress. Need I say more about good trouble? Because you see, that is the word of Congressman John Lewis, for he said that we all have to be about getting into some good trouble. What is good trouble? That is standing up for people who can't stand up for themselves. What is good trouble? That is speaking up for those who've been held silent. What is good trouble? That is saying, I'm sick and tired of being tired, so I ain't going to take it no more. Come on, Fanny Lou Hamer. What is good trouble? That is meaning that I'm going to stand rough on the right and not sit down in the wrong. God was coming to his people, y'all, through the womb of a virgin, and the God of the universe would experience human life. Now, don't miss this, y'all, because what's important for us to understand about the message of Christmas is that Jesus came from heaven down to earth to experience life just like we experienced life on earth. Jesus saw things through human eyes. Jesus heard things through human ears. Jesus tasted food through a human mouth. And this may seem rather insignificant, uh, Elder Deborah, but it is very important because when you stop and think just for a moment that Jesus experienced life the same way we experience life, that means that he had seen 
seen life up close and in personal, Elder William, in such a phenomenal way that he could not go back to heaven without carrying some of earth with him. And as he carried earth with him, he left some God with us. You see, not only does Jesus understand the very basics of life, but he also knows, y'all, the reality of human suffering. Jesus experienced the reality of pain. Jesus knows what it is and what it means to lose a loved one. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. Gee, am I talking to somebody this morning? Jesus knows what it's like to have physical pain. Jesus knows what it means to have somebody who love you do something in front of you, but then do something totally different behind your back. You see, Jesus, Emmanuel, means God is with us. That understands that whatever you are going through in life right now, our Savior has already been. Whatever you experience in your life right now, our Savior has already felt it. Whatever you're facing right now, our Savior knows your pain that you're going through. And somebody ought to be relieved right there to recognize we serve a Lord, a mighty God, a wonderful Savior, a wonderful counselor who's been through everything that you're facing right now. And for that, we give him glory. For that, we give him praise. For that, we shout hallelujah. For that, we say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The message of Christmas is about service. Service, 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 service. I got to give a shout out to the deacons of the church who are about some service right now because y'all, God is opening up the windows of heaven and pouring us out a blessing that we never have seen before. God is making folk go to the grocery store and buy groceries not for them but for somebody else. God is opening up your pantry and not cleaning out stuff you don't want no more, but God is putting something in your heart to give the very best to those who deserve it. You see, the message of Christmas is about service. The mission of the church, y'all, was to bring deliverance to all of God's people. And you see, when you are about service, the attention is not on you, but it is on Almighty God. Why? Because all of God's children matter. All of God's people, all of God's creation are important. Red, yellow, black, or white. We are all precious in his sight. Married, single, widowed, or divorced. Straight, gay, LGBTQ, or queer. We are all made in the image of Almighty God. And the good news is that the word says whosoever will, let them come. Let me see if I can illustrate this by giving you a quote by former President Bill Clinton. From former President Clinton says, as a young child, he learned early that everybody has a story and everybody's story has value. And because they have a value in their story, people are first. Can you type right there in the chat box, people are first. Matter of fact, you just type the word value. Look at somebody in your house if they're watching you right now and tell them you have value, okay? If you don't have them, pick up your phone, pick up your iPad, whatever you're looking at, go to the mirror, look at yourself and say you got value because you are important. Let me see if I could give two quick stories. Adele Thomas, y'all, and Jane and Scott Wolf. Dale Thomas, y'all, from the U.S. Virgin Island, St. John, her story is significant because she, after Hurricane Irma and, and Maria, Put, put together her family house that her granddaddy had built. And her story is, y'all, come heaven or high water, she had to put this house back together because granddaddy did his very best to give us a roof over our head. Am I talking to somebody right there? Because I don't want you ever to forget that you are who you are because of what somebody else has done for you. You have what you have because somebody else sacrificed. You live 
where you live because somebody else used to drive past your neighborhood wishing they could live there, but somehow, some way, God opened up a door and provided you with the means to live in a neighborhood that your ancestors could have never lived in their life. We stand on the shoulders of great men and women, and people never forget, my friends, never forget that we have what we have, not just to have it for ourselves, but in the Sankofa moment, we have to fly forward by looking back to bring somebody else along. Let me talk about Jane and Scott Wolf. Jane and Scott Wolf from New Orleans, Louisiana, they own a laundromat. Now, of course, some of y'all who are highfalutin now don't know what a laundromat is, but if you know what a laundromat is, won't you just type quarter right there in the chat box? Won't you talk dime right there in the chat box? If you know what a laundromat is, I'm talking about even you highfalutin suburbanites. When your wash machine breaks down and the GE man can't come to two weeks, you better put them clothes in a pillow case and take them to the laundromat, get you some soft soap suds. Okay, okay, I, I got digressed a little bit, so let me go with Jane. Jane and Scott Wolf in New Orleans, they own a laundromat, y'all, and this laundromat is not just a place to wash clothes, but they have now, Brother David, made it a hot spot for children to learn. They have made it an inspiration moment for families to gather in the laundromat. You see, you have to recognize that not only has COVID-19 closed the doors of traditional buildings, but it's opening up doors for new ministry. In a laundromat, children are studying. In a laundromat, financial classes are being taught. In a laundromat, why? Because there is value, value in folk. Recognize this, y'all. The purpose of Jesus coming into the world was to guide and to help people of God. The word, this, this wouldn't be done, y'all, because of his compassion for the people. The message of Christmas is really about the compassion of God given through Jesus to come into the world. And y'all, despite coming into the world, Herod didn't want to show hospitality to our Savior. The Bible says he was hostile. He was troubled. Herod showed hostility toward Jesus because he feared how the influences of Jesus would impact his position and his power. And you see, I cannot help y'all but to give a major shout out to somebody who does not let where they come from stop them to where they are going. Somebody who recognizes that I didn't start with a silver spoon in my mouth nor in a mansion, but I started in a community with hog farms and tobacco fields. And somehow, some way, I am now the director, y'all, of the Environment and Protection Agency. Can we talk about Michael Reagan, y'all? That brother from Goldsboro, North Carolina. Goldsboro, North Carolina, where they have hog farms and tobacco fields. And this brother who suffered with asthma, y'all, is now in charge of the Environmental Protection Aid. They didn't get it, Brother L. This brother who suffered breathing, y'all, in his community is now in charge of Environmental Protection Agency. This man who is a graduate of North Carolina A&T, can you type Aggie Pride right there, is in charge of all of Environmental Protection Agency thanks to President-elect Biden. And this man, y'all, who says, here it is, America's environmental laws and policies must first and foremost protect the most vulnerable. You see, the message of Christmas is not about how much you can get under your tree. It's about how much you can give to somebody else. Is that not what Pastor Lanson said? It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. If you want to talk about what you got for Christmas, I want to see a zero in your bank account because you gave everything that you had to somebody else. If you want to talk about how good God has been you to you in your life, don't open up your closets or your cupboards. I want want to see what's in your trunk that's on your way to give to somebody who does not have. You see, the, the Bible says, I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you gave me something to, to you come to visit me. I, I, I was hurting and you were there for me. It is what you've done to the very least of these. You've done it 
unto me. Don't be a heret, y'all. I want you to get into some good trouble. Can you say good trouble? Good, good trouble, good trouble. Let me tell more, go quickly. The second thing I want you to get in this text, y'all, is the message of Christmas will cause you to direct, direct you to obey. It's going to direct you to obey. Look what the Bible tells us, my friends, in verse 8. After having this engagement, a private meeting with Herod, the wise men, the magi, y'all, they were told to go to Bethlehem and search carefully for this child. And when you find him, come back and tell me that I too can go and worship him. The message of Christmas will cause you to follow directions and to obey. Obey. And I just say, but first of all, as a sidebar, as a footnote, that the wise men, these were intelligent uh, rulers who were following uh, a star that led them to the place where they wanted to worship Christ. Now, they got directions from God, but they also had directions from human beings. And friends, I just want to caution somebody to always check what people say with the word of God. Let me back it up, reel it in, and say it again. Always check and double check, fact check what people say to you to make sure it aligns to the word of Almighty God. You see, we got to stop following people, preachers and teachers who have their own opinion and their own agenda and trying to tell us this is what they, we should do, but we have to check what the word of God says before we follow what the man and woman of God says. You see, important to know that the message of Christmas leads to salvation. It's all about salvation, and, and I'm glad, I'm glad that, 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 that our church, our church leaders, our session, and our deacon are committed to evangelism and salvation. The Magi, y'all, were so concerned about seeing Jesus that they inquired where he was. They had seen a star. The, they perceived the star to be the place of divine mission, and God, my friends, stepped in and gave the Magi some supernatural natural ability to follow and lead to worship. And somebody watching right now or listening by way of the call are able to say that I know that God steps in and I know that God will come through with a supernatural way when man says one thing, God, is there anybody who want to help me shout right there? When people have told me I can't do it, God says all things are possible to those that believe. When people say say you can't get up, God says rise, take up your mat and walk. When people say you are sick, God says by my strength you are healed. When people say that you are nothing, God says all things are possible to those that believe. You get some supernatural power when you recognize that God is in charge of your life. You see, you see the primary message of the church, y'all, of of, of, of Christmas, the primary message of Christmas is the primary message of the church, and the primary message of the church is salvation. Okay, let me say it slow, because I'm from the country, and you might be from the country watching too, so don't, don't miss this. The primary message of Christmas and the primary message of the church is salvation. The primary message of the church, it, 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 it ain't about the building. Come on. We ain't been in here since March. So, so, so don't go talking about, it, it, it ain't about the choir. The primary message of the church, it's not about the preacher hooping. Does the preacher hoop or does he hack or does he squall or does he moan? It, the primary message of the church, it, 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 ain't about, it ain't about the color of the carpet. It's not about stained glass. It's not about do we have pews or do we have chairs. It's not about a screen. It's not about a parking lot. It's not about cleaning it. It's not about fish fries. It ain't about chicken dinners. It ain't about 
about, uh, ain't about anniversaries. The primary message of the church has to be about salvation. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to get my heart right? What must I do to let somebody know that God can make a way out of no way? I don't know if I'm stepping on some toes. I need to hark a little bit harder because God says the church has to be about saving souls. And everything we say and everything we do must be about bringing folk to a loving, saving relationship with Almighty God. The purpose, the purpose of Jesus coming into the world, my friends, was to guide the people of God to have a heart of compassion, a heart of service, and a heart of love. The purpose of the church, y'all, was to have a presence with God, the Magi. And y'all, they came to God and faith. It was their faith that brought them to the point of believing that Jesus was born. It was their faith that kept their eyes on the star. It was their faith that brought them to the place where they could worship the Lord. But you see, friends, before we can get the benefits of Christ coming at Christmas time, we must accept the invitation of Christ into our life right now. Before we can get the benefits of saying God can make a way out of no way, you need to make your way to the Lord right now. Before you can talk about that God brought me through, you have to come to the Lord right now. Oh, hymn of the church says, come to Jesus, come to Jesus right now for, for he can make your life brand new. God knows just what to do. Come, come to Jesus. Christmas, y'all, is, is about the grace of almighty God. I like the way Paul says it. Paul says and sums up that the purpose of Christmas is in one word, and that's grace. Grace, can you say grace? Can you type grace? Can, can you just understand what grace is? Great grace is, is giving you more than what you ask for. Grace is giving you more than what you deserve. Grace is giving you gravy on top of your rice. It's giving you french fries with your burger. It's giving you a milkshake with, okay, am I talking about food? It's, it's, it's the red light on the Krispy Kreme. Hallelujah, grace. It sets you up to be a witness for Almighty God. Here's the last point. The message of Christmas, y'all, will lead you to worship lead you to worship. The word worship, uh, Pastor Lanson, from the Greek is simply prokino, proskino, proskinos, and it simply means to kiss the hand of the master like a dog loves its master. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong picture, but the word itself means to prostrate yourself, to be so dependent upon your master. The word uh, of worship means that the fact that the master I came to worship God. These were wise men. These were leaders from their own country. It was more than three because I always give Brother L the footnote here at Christmas time. We keep singing, we three kings of Orient. Oh, that ain't in the Bible. It says they were wise men. The only way you got three kings because we probably had three little teenage boys in the junior high class and they need to have something to do in the Christmas play. Anyway, that's a sidebar. But they were were wise men and there were more than three. We always established three because of frankincense, a gold, and myrrh. No, these brothers came with multitudes. They were blessing Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. Now, what hit me, Sister Deborah, as I exegeted the text, I always thought they were bringing the gifts to Jesus. But understand, Jesus is the Son of God. He's got everything. But here's the out right here, y'all, when Joseph did not put Mary away because she was pregnant before they got married, and Mary did not abort the baby because she didn't know who the daddy was. They were faithful to Almighty God. When Joseph and Mary were faithful to God, God blessed them with a supernatural. Ooh, you missed your shout right there. God poured gold and frankincense and myrrh into their life because they were faithful to God's command. And somebody watching right Right now, I don't want you to get it twisted and get all out of shape, but God has blessed you because you have been faithful over a few things. Now you be Lord and master over many.
many things. God has blessed you because the message of Christmas is about how you celebrate God, how you elevate God, and how you lift up the presence of God in your life. Look what the Bible says. It says they entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. Then they opened up their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Despite y'all of what the wise men had come from, they had been from a land of plenty. Now they came to a God of minty, and that God that they were there with was a God, I made that up, Brother David, that the God that they were with was a God that accepted their gift. Ooh, that's good right there. The God that they were with was a God that accepted their gift. Their gift was given from their heart. They didn't come to worship empty-handed. They didn't come to worship broke. They didn't come to worship asking, can you give me a dollar to put in the offering plate? No, they came to worship with their very best. And they came to worship with their heart. They came to worship with the truth. These wise men recognized, though they were powerful in their own land, they were little people when they come before the presence of Almighty God. Or oh, I like the word the old singer say, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. The good news y'all is that the wise men recognize the truth and the truth will set you free. It is only at their recognition of the truth my friends that they began to worship God. Now now, now, you know I got excited last week when I heard the truth in the midst of the coronavirus. I heard the truth being told that a vaccine was on the way and the truth minister Donna that set me free was the truth coming y'all from none other than Dr. Kizmikia Shante Colbert. Kizmikia Shante Colbert, an African-American scientist who works at NIH from this virus that, that we've been, 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 been held captive by. Dr. Kizmikia Shante Colbert is one of the leading physicians and doctors who developed the vaccine. Okay, Dr. Kizmikia, 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 Shante Colbert. And I only say that name with emphasis because too many of us in my generation have been talking down about people naming their children names that we can't say. Well, if the mama can say the name, and can spell the name, and the child's answer to the name, one day that child might be the leading physician who develops a vaccine. Okay, you missed it right there. Quit talking about people naming their children because you can't spell the name. It ain't up to you, it ain't your baby anyway. It's their child. And I've said it before, it's not what they call you, it's what. See, see, they, 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 they probably call Kamesia Kizzy. Come here, Kizzy. Come here, little Kizzy. Guess what? Kizzy is now Dr. Kamikia, Kamiski, I can't miss her name, but Shantae, that's her name. Shantae. Come here, Shantae. Little Shantae. And, the, and, the, and, and her history, y'all, her history says she was born in a little rural town in, in, in North Carolina. Hurdle Mills, raised in Hillsboro, y'all. Graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. Went to University of Maryland in Baltimore County. This little country girl, Shantae, y'all, is doctor, and here's the shout, y'all. She said she was not going to miss the moment when 45 took his tour and saw who was developing the, the vaccine. Shantae says, uh-uh, I ain't going to be no hidden figure. I'm going to be seen because somebody's going to see that Shantae is the developer of the vaccine. It's the truth, y'all, and the truth will set you free. When you recognize that the truth will set you free, you'll recognize that you have a purpose, you have a passion, you have a position, and you have a right by the power and the message of Christmas. Okay, okay, let me see if I can close this because, see, the message of Christmas is all about worship, and worship keeps us in tune with God, in tune with God. Let me see if I can illustrate this. There's a story told of of a farmer who lived in Idaho. 
And each and every morning he would listen to a radio station and he wrote into the radio station, Brother George, and he asked them, the announcer, if he would please play the note A because when he heard the note A out there in the field where he was watching his sheep, it helped him tune his fiddle. And that fiddle that he had brought him consolation and it brought him inspiration, but that fiddle was old and it was out of tune. And if the radio station in the city part of Idaho would play the tune, the note A, the farmer could tune up his fiddle. And if he tuned it up his fiddle, he would stay in tune. Okay, you're not getting it. The radio station was hundreds of miles away. But the farmer wrote this, the shepherd wrote the letter. And he asked the announcer that when you start your radio show, if you could play the tune A, and as you play that, play that note A, it would help me tune my fiddle. And as I tune my fiddle, I would be in tune for the rest of the day. And I want somebody to hear what I'm saying because worship is really getting in tune with Almighty God. Somebody needs to hear me this Sunday morning. God is now playing a tune, a tune for you to tune up your fiddle, to tune up your heart, and to tune up your spirit so that you can hear the word of Almighty. God has placed a tune in your spirit right there, a tune that's better than silver and gold, a tune that's more impressionable than people a tune that will last with you that I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is asking somebody to tune up this morning. Tune up your spirit. Tune up your thought processes. Tune up your giving and tune up your living because when you are in tune with God my friends, you are receiving the message of Christmas. And I just want somebody to, to help me close the sermon here and get in tune to where God would have you to be. The message that you need to give right now is that God I need you into my life God I need you to help me walk the walk God I need you to help me talk the talk God I need you to help me have a loving forgiving heart I want somebody to get in tune right now with the message of Christmas if you are looking for a place to grow in the Lord I want you to write right now in the chat box that you're looking for Jesus if you know somebody who needs to get in tune with God. If you don't mind sharing their name or sharing the contact information with us as pastors, as a team, we're going to pray for them. If you need prayer right now, call, 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 call Pastor Lanson, Dr. Carol, type whatever it is, the way we can get in contact with you because I don't want you to miss the message of Christmas, the message of Christmas. Pray with me. Lord God, we thank you that wise men from the east came to worship the Lord. God, we thank you because as they came to worship the Lord, they got themselves into some good trouble. And that good trouble was that I will let nothing stop me from meeting the Lord. God, we thank you that the wise men, they, they were obedient to follow your will. For God, you provided a supernatural star for them, so we now ask for some supernatural power to help us get through what we're in right now. And God, we are so grateful that the wise men did not stop because they came to Christ, but they worshiped Christ with their very best. And so God, we want you to use us, whatever it is that we have, not the leftovers, but the first fruits. God, whatever it is you provided for us, we want you to take it all, if it's our hands, our voice, our mind, our gifts, our spirit. God is more precious than silver and gold. So we pray now that you will hear our prayer. God, we confess with our mouths that we messed up and slipped up. God, we acknowledge you as being the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And God, we yield our will over to your will and ask that you would take total control. For God, we pray this prayer not just for ourselves, but we pray for our children and our children's children. We pray for our neighbors and our co-workers. God, we pray for our teachers and our students. God, we pray for preachers and, and, and Christian educators. We pray, God, for seminarians. We pray, God, for those on the battlefield who want to stand and proclaim your truth. 
God, let your will be done. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and all of God's children say amen. My friends, we thank you so much, and as we continue to worship, we just want you to know that there is a place where you can grow in the Lord. And we believe it's right here. This is a body of Christ. It's virtual. No, you don't have to come to the church, but let us connect with you. We're grateful for the musicians that minister in music. We're grateful for the prayer warriors that pray every morning. We're grateful for, for the psalmists that sing. We're grateful for the technicians that bring this message to you. And I ask that not only will you watch it as you have right now, but you'll share it with somebody else. Let them know the message of Christmas is the message of Christ. I am Pastor Cannon. I love you. I care about you. And I want you to know that this is a place where you can grow in the Lord. Look, we look forward to worshiping with you every morning at 7 o'clock on our prayer call. We just got three more days before our Christmas break, so tune in, dial that number. We want to pray with you every morning and celebrate. Get your day started right. We do have pastors again, Pastor Lance and Dr. Carol. They're still online. Just type whatever prayer request you may have, and we will do all we can to pray with you. Matter of fact, come on by the church today. We're going to be here at 2 o'clock passing out gifts of prayer, of anointing oil, and all that it takes for us to be in connection with you. If it's raining outside, you need a, you need a prayer. If the sun's shining, you still need a prayer. Don't let the weather stop you from receiving your blessing. We're going to do it social distance. We ain't going to get up close to you. We're going to be far enough away, but we will hear your prayer request and pray with you. We're so grateful for our Stephen ministry and others that are making this possible today. So here's how we want to leave. I want you to give somebody a high five, virtual high five, wherever you are. Let them know that God loves you. We love you. We look forward to working with you on next Sunday. Y'all have a great week.